gente, a primeira coisa era checar se estava gravando, então tá tudo ótimo. Bom, pessoal, estou aqui muito feliz, uma honra estar tá abrindo aqui a comunidade da Paneros, é um prazer mais do que imenso. E antes de qualquer coisa, é, eu gostaria de começar agradecendo a honra de ter aqui a presença da Gabi, né, que, nossa querida Gabi, que foi por muitos anos a nossa, a minha carinha pelo menos, tinha Edu, tinha Thales, mas a Gabi era uma pessoa muito referência para mim, assim, eu adorava quando via os vídeos dela, então é, eu queria, então em especial, começar agradecendo por ela estar aqui hoje, sei que ela fez um esforço para estar aqui com a gente hoje, agradecer por todos os anos em que ela nos ajudou, né, a tocar essa comunidade, fazer um monte de coisa por todos nós, em conjunto aqui com várias pessoas que também vão, vão falar. E, então, eu queria fazer esse agradecimento e passar a palavra para a gente ouvir a Gabi em primeiro lugar. Nossa, Flávia, que, que surpresa, que honra. Não, não esperava que você me colocasse no spotlight assim. <risos> de cara. É... Uau! É, tô aqui com um pouco de frio na barriga nesse momento, é muito especial estar aqui de volta, foi um, uma pausa aí de um ano, acho que foi merecido, né, a gente compartilhou bastante conteúdo, muitos convidados, assim, dois anos e meio de Comunidade Faneros, três edições, e agora voltando de cara nova, roupa nova, energias novas, ideias novas, então, desejo para todo mundo um ano incrível. Eu estou, assim, muito entusiasmada para ser parte da comunidade de Faneros e não ser a comunidade de Faneros. <risos> é, então, é isso, pessoal. Sejam todos bem-vindos, bem-vindas, bem-vindes. E que a gente tenha um ano de muitas descobertas e trocas ricas e curiosidades e desenvolvimento. Obrigada. A gente que agradece, Gabi. Isso não é uma despedida, né? A gente vai querer aqui muito ter você presente. Que bom que você ainda é parte de tudo isso. Bom, então, eu... eu queria... Obrigada. Eu queria passar agora a palavra para o Edu, né? para dar as boas-vindas aqui para a gente. Valeu, alô pessoal, obrigado Mar, Flávia, Gabi, todo mundo, todos os coordenadores, todos os membros, fundadores, não fundadores, novos, velhos, antigos, jovens, idosos, de todos os cantos do Brasil, aqueles que estão no exterior, uma alegria enorme estar de volta com a comunidade Faneros, para aqueles que já frequentavam, estão vendo que a equipe está maior, cresceu, está mais diversa, plural, bonita, é, acho que a gente vai ter um ano incrível pela frente. É, acho que acabamos de ver aqui a, a, simbolicamente essa passagem de bastão da Gabi para a Flávia. Então, basicamente, o trabalho que a Gabriela fazia é, esse ano vai ser tocado pela Flávia. É, e o que era basicamente eu e o Thales, é, agora mais gente fazendo. Né? Então, temos vários coordenadores, acho que estão todos aqui presentes hoje, vão poder se apresentar também. Então é isso, pessoal. A gente está muito animado. Estou ah, vendo que tem várias perguntas no chat, perguntas técnicas comuns. A Flávia vai falar um pouquinho sobre isso também, como é que funciona aqui os, esses webinários no Zoom, a diferença do chat com o Q&A, perguntas e respostas. Né? E a gente está à disposição. Né? A ideia é fazer esses encontros com muita qualidade, com profundidade, né? mas também com descontração. Né? a gente não faz da comunidade Faneros um espaço formal, é, a gente não faz aqui um espaço de aprendizagem mais hierárquica, a gente gosta de fazer é, realmente uma comunidade. Né? Então, a gente também aprende muito com, com todos os participantes, com todas as trocas, não só aqui nos encontros semanais, mas no canal e no grupo que a gente tem no WhatsApp, é, e por e-mail... E a comunidade também é um espaço é, onde muitas amizades estão se formando, se consolidando. Eu quero saber se já tem namoro de comunidade Faneros, se algum dia vai ter filho da CP, né? Então as pessoas vão se, vão se conhecendo. A gente tem hoje aqui também a presença do Macari, o Nicuí, 
House House, Chai, bem-vindo. Bom ter você aqui conosco. Macari, gratidão. vem lá do Jordão, no Acre, é, região, inclusive, que está passando por um dos maiores alagamentos da história. Então, pedimos a contribuição de todo mundo é, para enviar doações. Macari, se quiser falar um pouquinho sobre isso, é muito, muito importante. Eu postei no Instagram, isso saiu na Folha de São Paulo, não é só o Jordão, o Acre inteiro está basicamente em situação de emergência climática. Macari, quer falar um pouquinho sobre isso? Passo a palavra para você. House, boa noite a todos, irmãos e irmã. É, primeiramente, eu quero agradecer ao nosso grande espírito Ipacuxipá, é, agradecer a todos os seres vivos, seres encantados. Eu estou muito feliz de estar aqui com vocês agora, entrando nesse grupo. Gratidão, Edu, gratidão, Marina, gratidão a todos. É, eu me chamo Macari Runicuim, né? sou jovem, tinha aprendiz do Acre, estou chegando aqui. É, chegando para mim eu estudar e eu estou muito feliz então no momento é, eu estou aqui em São Paulo né primeira vez eu vim com meu tio Banã foi a Marina Edu convidaram para poder vir trabalhar com, com os alunos e fazer trazer esses conhecimentos do nosso povo quando eu cheguei conheci O Tia Yuri, Edu, Marina, conheci vários amigos, o Tia Itales, gratidão, Tia Itales. É, então, Tia, é um momento difícil que está passando a necessidade do povo Nicuim, né? É sobre a alagação, né? não é brincadeira. É, foi muita chuva e o água chegou surpresa, né? A gente... Perdemos vários materiais, nosso legume, né? E o rio carregou várias casas do nosso parente, do povo Nicuim, não só do município de Jordão, acho que foi 18. É, foi 18 municípios, parece, né? Então, estou aqui também pedindo apoio, ajuda para quem é sentir de coração para poder ajudar o povo Zunicuim, não só para mim também, que vocês estão dando, mas o povo Zunicuim, então, meus parentes estão é, tipo, pedindo também, Macari, você está aí com, com comunidade, com os amigos, então podemos você pedir esse apoio para poder nós recuperar o que a gente perdemos. Né? Então, estou aqui pedindo para o nosso povo, então estou muito feliz de estar aqui também entrando como um, é, formação também, né? eu sou jovem, Eu estou terminando meu ensino médio e agora estou querendo passar por faculdade. Eu entrei nesse, nesse caminho muito, muito importante também para eu aprender com vocês e para a gente aprender junto, Tchai. Muito gratidão, Raul, Raul. Estou muito feliz. E, Ru... Você não sabe a felicidade dessa criança aqui hoje. Então, muito obrigado, gente, pelo convite. É, depois eu vou botar lá no grupo do WhatsApp as informações, tá bom? Para quem quiser saber Ai. um pouco mais. Gratidão. Obrigado, eu joguei, joguei o link da, da Folha de São Paulo, é, cobrindo a situação no Acre, e também de uma das opções de doação para o Sunicuim aqui no chat. Flávia, é contigo. Ok. Então agora eu passo a palavra para a gente ouvir um pouquinho o Thales. Thales, por favor. Boa noite, pessoal. Feliz de ver todo mundo aqui, ver a CP, essa chama... É acendendo, que a gente deixou ela dormente em 2023 e agora estamos aqui de volta. E ah, acho que queria reiterar o que o Edu falou da nossa proposta de levar esse ano com profundidade, mas de uma forma descontraída, com tranquilidade na comunicação entre nós. E gostoso ver os colegas aqui que eu fui conhecendo ao longo desse caminho, desde que a gente começou a comunidade lá em 2020, alguns já estavam. Aqui, Júlia estava desde o começo, outros foram chegando, a gente foi se conhecendo ao longo da FOPAP, e vendo essa, esse, esse tronco central da CP agora, se lembrando em outros ramos, é, a gente vai estar tá trabalhando com as vertentes ao longo desse, desse ano, acho que a Flávia vai trazer um pouquinho dos eixos também, ou os coordenadores dos eixos. Então, é isso, estou muito feliz de estar tá aqui, seguimos juntos, vai ser ótimo estar tá aqui, aprender tanto com convidados, e chegar e trocar com vocês, se eu puder ensinar alguma coisa também vai ser ótimo. Trocar junto. Valeu. Obrigada, Thales.
Marina, dá um oi para a gente também. Boa noite, pessoal. Sou a Marina, estou é, aqui para auxiliar vocês no que for possível. É, sempre atenta lá no nosso canal do WhatsApp, é, mas também a gente tem, além de mim, queria agradecer a nossa equipe de suporte, que é o Fábio e a Viviane. Então, vocês sempre podem contar com a gente. É, sejam todos muito bem-vindos, é um prazer estar aqui com vocês. Contem comigo. Beijinho. Bom, eu queria, então, continuar agora já dizendo que eu vou fazer algumas apresentações bem rápidas aqui de algumas carinhas que estão com a gente. Seria maravilhoso a gente ficar aqui se apresentando todo mundo, mas inviável nesse momento. Então, eu vou começar é, mostrando um pouco das carinhas que vocês já estão vendo por aí, dos nossos coordenadores de eixos. Então, a gente tem Julia Kruger, que está por conta do tema Histórias, Filosofias e Epistemologias. Aí a gente tem Isabela Cassani, que está cuidando do tema ancestralidade, atualidades, ética e medicalização. Daniel Farias, direto de Porto Alegre, falando, né, cuidando do tema neurociências, transtornos mentais e indicações clínicas da PAP. Isabel Vargas, uh, que está cuidando de plantas, fungos, substâncias e farmacologia. E o Yuri, que está ali do lado do Macari, é, cuidando de abordagens psicoterapêuticas. Esses são os nossos cinco primeiros eixos. O meu áudio tá ruim, é isso? Tá um pouco baixinho, Flá. Não sei se colocar Agora... o microfone um pouco mais para Pronto. Agora tá bom? Tá. Obrigada, gente. Então, é... eu perdi aqui um pouco, mas bem, apresentei os cinco, né? E acho que uma das coisas mais importantes é a gente ter a oportunidade aí de nos conhecer. E eu queria, então, aproveitar para pedir para vocês continuarem se apresentando lá na, no WhatsApp. Quem não entrou ainda, eu vou pedir para a Marina depois colocar o link aqui do nosso grupo do WhatsApp. É, a gente está migrando do Telegram para o WhatsApp, então isso é bem importante. Lá no, no WhatsApp a gente tem a área de avisos e a área de... É, a área de, da comunidade, onde a gente pode todo mundo se apresentar e tudo mais. Uh, eu queria aproveitar... Agatha, se você puder escrever aqui para a gente, por favor. Uh, eu queria aproveitar para dizer que nós enviamos para vocês um book que a gente criou com o conteúdo dos nossos primeiros seis encontros. Então, a ideia é que vocês sempre recebam com alguma antecedência o conteúdo dos próximos encontros. Eu queria aproveitar para dizer que a gente guarda também a, a, a oportunidade de poder fazer mudança sempre que a gente desejar. Então, a gente tem uma programação completa para o ano inteiro, mas se su surgir um novo assunto, acontecer alguma novidade, a gente vai guardar esse direito de fazer mudanças pelo benefício da comunidade. Vocês podem, inclusive, sugerir, sugerir coisas para a gente. Mas esse book, que vai ser entregue aí mais ou menos a cada mês ou mês e meio, ele vai ter referências bibliográficas, indicações, o resumo do que a gente está querendo apresentar, convidados e etc. Então, depois eu ponho o link aqui também do book. Uh, o nosso formato aqui é de webinário, isso é bem importante, pode ser que em algum momento a gente tenha algo diferente, mas a ideia é que a gente, como nós estamos aqui, a gente tem algumas carinhas aparecendo, depois a gente vai ter a Érica, que já está aqui presente, que vai falar com a gente. E, então, a gente vai ter um webinário, que são aí, é, dependendo do momento, hoje estão previstos 40 minutos com ela e depois 20 minutos de perguntas. Então, a gente tem o Q&A, lá no Q&A vocês podem construir perguntas e o grupo pode ir votando nas perguntas que estão mais interessados e a gente vai fazendo essa curadoria depois de que perguntas que a gente vai usar depois. Vocês também podem usar o raise hand, levantar a mãozinha, que lá naqueles 20 minutos a gente vai selecionando algumas pessoas para poder vir aqui para a sala, com câmera ligada, para poder falar. Infelizmente, quem está no YouTube não consegue fazer essa interação com a gente, então a gente convida vocês para estarem com a gente na comunidade, nas próximas sessões, mas a gente tem uma galera no YouTube assistindo a gente também hoje, gente. Bom, é, tem uma coisa bem importante para a gente dizer para vocês, que é por favor, usem o e-mail suporte.institutofaneiros.org.br, que daqui a pouco vai estar aqui no chat também, para é, tocar as coisas mais pessoais, problemas de link, questões que são é, de ordem administrativas que diz respeito a cada um de vocês. É, lá nesse e-mail do suporte, a gente vai estar sempre alguém é, tentando o mais rápido possível ajudar vocês. Uh, então, as nossas estruturas dos encontros são sempre das sete, às 8 horas da noite, às terças-feiras, 
a ideia é a gente permanecer nesse tempo, não passar muito disso e sempre podendo é, ter um tempo para perguntas e respostas e tudo mais. Bom, é, a gente está quase na hora de começar com a Érica, tem uma coisa bem importante que acontece hoje aqui, que é a tradução, que o Fernando, que está aqui, a gente consegue ver, ele também vai estar tá fazendo para a gente. Então, quem quiser é, ouvir a tradução da, fa da fala da Érica para o português, tem que entrar na, no ícone ali embaixo no Zoom, que é o Interpretation, ou Interpretação. E lá tem vários tem três canais. O canal original, que é esse que estamos todos aqui nesse momento, e o canal de português para quem estiver desejando usar o português. É, and for Erica, she might need the English channel when we will make questions to her. É, então, estou só falando aqui que para a Erica, talvez ela tenha que usar o canal de inglês quando a gente vai fazendo pergunta para ela. É, então, estamos aqui no momento de começar a nossa apresentação. Eu vou passar novamente a palavra para o Edu que conhece pessoalmente a Érica, para fa falar com ela. Obrigado, Flávia. Então, vou pular aqui para o canal em inglês. Érica, welcome very much. It's a pleasure to, to see you again and to, to be with you. It would be wonderful to listen to you. Um, it's the second time Érica is coming to the Faneros community. Uh, she's been here before. And I'll say again uh, what I said that time, uh, but maybe a bit differently. But Erica's, uh, I will say first book, maybe it's not her first book, but I think it's the first book uh, about psychedelics, which is this book here, LSD from clinic to campus, um, was very important for me personally. So when I read this book, um, maybe 20 years ago or something like that, 20 to 15 years ago, probably more like 20. Uh, this gave me hope that uh, studying psychedelics was a serious stuff, could be done uh, with quality uh, and, and uh, that the, the absence of uh, uh, psychedelics in biomedicine and in science uh, that at that time was so big Uh, was a mistake. So this book was very influential, and I know uh, not only for me, so Erika is a true pioneer of the field, because she was doing uh, her studies and writing and publishing papers uh, way before the hype, and she never stopped. Um, this is another very great book uh, that I highly recommend, and uh, this one is way bigger, as you can see. <laughs> And this is the uh, complete uh, set of correspondences, uh, letters between Aldous Huxley and Humphrey Osmond, uh, two very important uh, folks in psychedelic history. Aldous Huxley, uh, more well-known, famous uh, British writer, and Humphrey Osmond, the Canadian psychiatrist who invented the word psychedelic, right? So uh, very important uh, historical document here. And uh, Erica, welcome once again. Thank you so much uh, for agreeing to be here for the launch of the uh, Faneros community. And sorry, there's a prompt here about language. What's going on? I speak two languages, Zoom. Let me speak two languages. <laughs> uh, Zoom wants me to force me to speak only one language. I refuse. <laughs> So, Erica, thank you once again uh, for coming, for joining us. And I know you have new books uh, coming out. Uh, one, I think, is already published, right, about the global histories or global history of psychedelics, uh, which I think is a timely publication again. And uh, I read what the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where I think you are uh, now, uh, they, they wrote about this, that there are There is not one psychedelic history in the singular, but many, and that you discuss this in the new book. So maybe uh, if you want, you can start about this. And that's it. Uh, you have the floor for a, a bit more than 40 minutes. Uh, if you need a bit more, it's okay. And everyone to remember to send your questions uh, with the Q&A feature of this webinar. 
so we can organize and in the chat is more like a freestyle conversation everyone with everyone but the questions uh, for Erica sent uh, by the Q&A and if you want uh, to ask the questions in video and audio just use the raise your hand button and we can uh, uh, put you in uh, to use this feature as well. Erika, welcome and thank you uh, once again, once more. Thank you so much, Eduardo and Flavia and everyone for inviting me. I am indeed in a hotel room in Madison. Tomorrow I'm excited to go visit their psilocybin lab and continue this uh, history of the future of psychedelics, I think. <laughs> Um, I wonder if I can share my screen, if I am allowed with yes, Zoom, and I will, because that will hopefully keep me on track, more or less. <laughs> I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be back speaking with you today, and I want to make sure that I can, that I can see, um, in case I'm going too fast, so it, Fernando will, will hold me accountable. I will. I'm really excited to share some new work with you that new old work as a historian, I'm always looking at old work, but it's new to me. And, and I hope that it inspires some future conversations that are definitely beyond my scope. And by that, I mean, and Eduardo set this up beautifully. I really think there are diverse histories of psychedelics and even the word psychedelics doesn't capture the full scope of what's at stake when we think about what might be involved in this so-called resurgence. And I use these images to start us off. Um, there are many to choose from, but I think one of the, the ways that the resurgence is being guided is a tension between that which happens in a lab or represented here in a beaker with, I think, mushrooms produced by AI, and that which comes from cultural performances or cultural practices and the image here actually comes from a San Francisco um, magazine, but it is meant to represent um, both indigenous culture, but also elements of counterculture or things that we might see definitely outside of the frame of science and medicine. So I'm going to use that to kind of frame our entry here today. But in part because I knew I was speaking with you folks tonight, I wanted to pay respect to the origins of Phaneros, at least the linguistic origins, um, and the concept of Phanerothyme that was a competitor for the word psychedelic. As Eduardo alluded to or showed you the Psychedelic Prophets book, the word psychedelic did not come about by accident, and it was certainly not inevitable. The conversations between Humphrey Osmond and Aldous Huxley played with different kinds of words to try to imagine the word or framing or concept that might help us to think outside of orthodox theories, to move beyond the bounds of kind of traditional medicine or Western medicine for these two men. And Aldous Huxley suggested, and you can see it there on the, perhaps if you can read the writing there, to make this trivial world sublime, take half a gram of phanerothyme which I think is where Phaneros takes its name, I presume. Um, but all the, sorry, Humphrey Osmond uh, responded, and you can see it in the red ink down below, to plumb the depths or soar angelic, just take a pinch of psychedelic. But you can see that these two words were very much in close contest. And uh, so I, I just, uh, I'm really excited that you've taken on this name and keep up that linguistic tradition. <laughs> So when I started this work, and it wasn't 20 years ago, Eduardo, we're not that old. Um, it was only, the book was published in 2008, but I began my studies officially in the early 2000s. I had done a little bit of work in the 1990s. Embarrassingly for me, I met Timothy Leary in the 1990s, but I didn't know who he was. And I didn't have a handheld device where I could quickly look up who he was. And I didn't go to the library that day. So a missed opportunity, we might say, for uh, not knowing who this psychonaut was. But I began my studies in the early 2000s looking into psychedelic science 
and trying to understand why a group of people came together in the part of the prairies where I live, where I just left. It was minus 33 and the snow was almost oh. up to my chest. Um, why would people go to that place to study a bunch of mind altering substances or theories or ideas? And it's people like Humphrey Osmond who connected with others like Aldous Huxley, who gave rise to some of these ideas and some of the conversations. The image here is a photograph taken the time that Aldous Huxley had his first dose of mescaline. And it's just a quick snapshot of him looking out over the vista in Los Angeles through mescalinized eyes, if you can read Humphrey Osmond's writing at the bottom there. So I was drawn to this sort of the people who were drawn to these ideas and what they how they made sense of them and where they looked for inspiration to give meaning to these non-ordinary experiences. And of course, the word psychedelic created in 1956 is not the only moment in time historically when people have tried to give a word or create a container for trying to understand a variety of experiences that we now consider within this psychedelic umbrella. Some of them predate the word psychedelic, some of the ideas and experiences. And of course, I'm only talking about the Anglo world here. I am well aware as I speak through a translator to you that my own uh, capacity to do this history is very much limited, um, except through collaboration, which I hope to inspire with this talk. But there are a number of ways that people have tried to organize the ideas, the theories, both within a scientific context, but also within a literary and ceremonial context to try to appreciate how we might put a container or boundary on these experiences. And in the work that Eduardo also alluded to, um, we just published a book, I say we, because it really was a team of people who published a book about the global experiences of psychedelics. And again, we hope this is a jumping off point, an inspirational point to look at the variety of ways that psychedelics have come to be known around the world. And here I'm gonna use the word psychedelic specifically, but it refers back to a whole variety of different kinds of traditions. In Chinese herbal medicine, for example, I will not even attempt to tell you about what happened in Brazil, because let me say it was just very exciting to learn about it, but I'm sure you all know more than I do. And uh, we can do a pop quiz at the end to see how many of you have that record still in your possession or on your Spotify list. Um, Cause I haven't yet met a Brazilian in Canada who doesn't, but that may just show, tell you who I hang out with. There are a variety of these kinds of psychedelic projects that have been bedded down and are kept sometimes in archives, but often they also exist on the margins, in personal libraries, in underground repositories, or in someone's personal collection of underground magazines. You can see a Japanese magazine on the perhaps on the right-hand side of your screen, Uzoko Tribes. Um, this was the makings of one particular artist, but a group of, of young men mostly in Japan who produced an underground kind of zine or magazine to talk about psychedelic culture in Japan, but they don't exist online and they're really hard to find in libraries. Um, so these kinds of stories exist in a variety of places that aren't always visible to us, even with today's internet. <laughs> And I want to suggest coming back to that image of the beaker and a piece of art, we might say that represents a more cultural expression that although a lot of this story has been dominated by an Anglo context and certainly an American context, there are cultural expressions that take on different forms around the world as well. We might think about the hippie trail through the Middle East and into even into Goa we might think about different pathways where psychedelics took root through Muslim communities or through Israel in the image that you see, the large image on the bottom of this. This is a, a Jewish Israeli um, psychedelic group from the 1960s. The image has been colored, but um, it's meant to represent that era. And you'll recognize some uh, Brazilian motifs here as well. 
not that to say that this was psychedelic, but I think part of a psychedelic resurgence in the 1950s and 60s, at least. So one of our first tasks when we try to get a snapshot or get our heads around what was at stake with a global history of psychedelics was to scour the digital repositories of scientifically produced literature. So not the personal archives of people or not those magazines that are in someone's basement or closet, um, but what we could find online. And these maps that were produced for us, I should say by Jeffrey Wallace, oh, it is on the top, it's just cut off on my screen. I wanna make sure I acknowledge my cartographer. The maps that he produced help to show where some of these ideas seem to have been rooted and where they traveled to. But as a historian who likes to talk to people, they're also really frustrating for what they don't tell us regarding the kinds of stories that didn't make their way online or didn't find themselves in published repositories or libraries. So there are big gaps and big uh, sort of geographical areas that don't seem to be represented, yet we know that psychedelics existed or had uh, cultural expression in many of these places. Nonetheless, they're kind of fun maps to play with. <laughs> so when I started my journey on psychedelic history, I started with psychedelic science, in part because those were the sources I could find. The library contained the published records of people who had engaged in an earlier psychedelic renaissance, we might say. I don't think anyone's actually saying that, but an earlier generation of psychedelic research that began in the 1950s and spilled into the 1960s before it was sort of overtaken by a countercultural movement, or so goes the standard narrative. I was interested in why the American CIA was funding this research, and that turns out to be only one part of the story, of course. And I was interested in what drew researchers to psychedelic drugs in the first place. And some of the story has now become popular and you can see it on Netflix, you can read it in best-selling books by journalists, um, and a few historians are trying to also complicate this story, and I, I'll pay homage to them, I hope. So in some respects, the story about psychedelics, if we come to LSD as one of the origin points, starts in Switzerland, when in 1938, Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman first synthesized this ergotamine substance this fungus that grows on rye, and we know had been affecting communities at least since the Middle Ages and probably earlier. And of course, he doesn't actually have an experience with LSD or d lysergic acid diethylamide. I'm checking Fernando here, making sure I'm not going too fast. Um, until 1943, and this sort of launches us into that psychedelic moment. But what historians are now starting to problematize is this idea of why was Albert Hoffman looking at this in the first place? And I should have put this book up, but there's a great book, Auf Deutsch, it's in German, called LSD Auf dem Land, written by Beat Bacci. Um, I can give these references if anyone has questions. And this is just one example of why it's so important to look outside and think about those other contributions. Beat Bacci, writes about what the Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company was interested in. They're looking into agricultural research. They're trying to understand how to harness the powers of ergot, which they thought would be best applied in obstetrics and gynecology. They knew that midwives had been using ergot substances to control contractions in women for some time, often without writing this down, often without um, telling anybody about it, because these practices were very controversial. They could, of course, bring upon a birth at the end of a term, but they could also bring about births or contractions before a baby was viable. That is, women may be helping to procure what we would call abortions. This controversial application of ergot meant that women were not sharing this knowledge widely. This is the kind of stuff that you don't find in the libraries 
or in those missionary reports or in the priest's reports. But Sandoz discovered that midwives had been using ergot and wanted to harness those powers or harness that kind of um, application in their pharmaceutical, their growing pharmaceutical industry. So you see an image there of a woman inoculating rye that is trying to make it grow more ergot. Now, ergot can be very dangerous. Um, if it's eaten by cattle, it destroys their milk supplies. If it's ingested by people, it can have very damaging effects. So Sandoz is moving food supplies during the Second World War out of circulation to ramp up their pharmaceutical production. And this is part of what Bayat Bachi talks about as we try to understand this larger context of what was at stake with ergot production, which led to LSD production. Anyway, you can read about it now in the newly republished ergot alkaloids that has just been released by, I think, Synergetic Press. But of course, that's not the story. We don't want to throw cold water on psychedelics, typically. Um, so the story goes that Albert Hoffman first had his experience on April 16th, 1943. A few days later, he decided that it, it was good enough to try on purpose. So on April 19th, he had the first intentional LSD experience. Famously, he hopped onto his bicycle and felt that he'd been plunged into a Salvador Dali painting. He got himself home with the support of his lab assistant, Susie Ramstein, and he wrote about his experience that has now been memorialized and celebrated by psychedelic enthusiasts around the world as Bicycle Day. And you can see different examples of this, and you can see it's being memorialized and even caricatured in some graphic novels, two of which I've got here for you to take a look at. I also just want to acknowledge that probably we know about this in part because his, his lab assistant, Susie Ramstein, took notes. She took care of him and made sure that he got home safely. So I want to acknowledge her as probably the first woman to ever take LSD. Um, she got married, her name changed, and we lost her to history in some respects, but we also think she took public transit. So it's a, maybe we should celebrate, I think it's June 19th, but uh, I should look that up and we should have a women's psychedelic public transit day. <laughs> The introduction of LSD coincided with massive changes in the field of psychiatry and in Western mental health systems more broadly. This, is, this coincides with the first generation of antipsychotic medication, with antidepressant medications, antihistamines, and really a kind of revolution in thinking about treating psychiatric disorders with psychopharmaceuticals. So instead of people living out their, uh, their lives in large scale mental hospitals or asylums, now pharmaceuticals were poised to help ameliorate or mitigate symptoms so that people could live out their lives in communities, at least theoretically. It also coincides with the introduction of the American Psychiatric Association's first Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders or the DSM. And now in its fifth edition, it has become a kind of classic text or the Bible of psychiatry. There's much to say about this, but I think changing the way we both name disorder and treat it had very profound effects for how we think about psychiatry, how we fund mental health systems, and this ricocheted around the world. So I want to come back to psychedelics for a moment in that context of major changes to psychiatric systems and of a real ramping up both of the financing, but also the research in psychopharmaceuticals. This little corner of the world, Saskatchewan, maybe you can see it on the map there on the left hand side. It's, it's a bit of a, a rough estimate as to where Saskatchewan might be. But anyway, the middle ish, slightly to the left of the middle in Canada, um, like I said, a cold prairie part of the world. Um, 
Saskatchewan elected the first social democratic government in North America. They did so on a promise to reform healthcare, including psychiatry. And in that moment, they became something of an ideological magnet, attracting people from a variety of parts of the world, mostly Anglo parts of the world, to start to invest in changing the way we think about madness, mental health, and illness. And one of the people who came was British trained psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond. And he, along with another a group of colleagues, came and joined in this effort to try to reframe how we think about suffering and distress and even things that we might later call trauma in the spirit of these massive reforms taking place in psychiatry with the support of a government who was elected on a promise to create publicly funded healthcare. So imagine you have funds and political will, and this really helped to support their sustained efforts to investigate psychedelic drugs. Initially, they believed that substances like LSD and mescaline would give insight for staff. They thought LSD was a psychomimetic or a madness mimicking drug. They believed that by taking LSD, nurses, psychologists, social workers, staff members, maybe even a couple of politicians would empathize with their psychiatric patients. They could help to appreciate how difficult it might be to explain what a disorder felt like, what it was like to experience a hallucination or delusion, auditory or otherwise. Even if it wasn't exact, they felt that this was a useful teaching tool, a useful way for people to empathize with patients. One example is um, a woman, Kay Parley, who I have here, her, her own book and her own words is written, uh, sorry, pictured on the right-hand side of the screen. Kay Parley suffered from what was described then as manic depression. Um, the name means a little different now, but she had a number of breakdown episodes as she described them. And she was discouraged from taking LSD, but she was friends with Aldous Huxley's nephew. Francis Huxley, who was visiting Saskatchewan in the 1950s. And he suggested that she should try some. She did. She had a terrible time. She felt that she was being sucked into the floor. She couldn't find herself anymore. Her, her sense of the edges of her body had melted into her environment and she was quite distressed. But as she came through this, she found these kaleidoscopic like images. Many people have talked about, use that kind of language to describe these. And she felt that the experience on LSD allowed her to appreciate that those breakdown moments she'd experienced without LSD were part of her, were something that she didn't need to reject or resist, but something that she could actually even try to love. She could feel whole that her madness was not another alter ego, but it was part of her. And Kay went on to graduate from psychiatric nursing and became a coveted sitter or guide for people going through psychedelic treatments as she tried to make sense of her own way of being that brought together these two parts of herself that she felt before she couldn't reconcile. I, I should mention just very quickly, I had tea with Kay Parley a couple of weeks ago. She is going to be 102 um, in a few days. And so I need to tell her story quickly. She said, you, she said, everyone should, you know, uh, or I said, what, what advice do you have for someone who would like to take LSD? And she just looked at me very matter of fact and said, take it with a Huxley. It's the best. <laughs> so I think Faneros people need to know that Huxley was a good guide. <laughs> One of the things that researchers readily recognized was that it was not just the pharmacological experience. It wasn't just the drug that was causing people to have insights or help them to see things in a different way. The drug interaction was also really changed depending on the environment. 
the idea that you should, you know, take LSD or mescaline or psilocybin or DMT or anything else later on in a particularly constructed environment became really important. But how do you best determine which environment or what kind of environment to take these substances in? Researchers were aware of the fact that music and carpet in this case, or wall colors, lighting, affected how people experienced LSD, for example. But how to systematize that became a question for a number of researchers. This is an image from a 1952, um, it's not even a publication, it's kind of notes. Um, I'm hoping to publish some of these in the near future, but attempts to try to make sense of some of the ways that people perceive their environment, and then perhaps even how to create, I'll call it a safe environment, although that's not the word they used. They didn't say optimize either, but how to take stock of the environment and create a space that would help people to feel good. Um, and they stumble with language about how best to describe this or whether or not you could create that at scale. Should every environment look the same? This was not a question that they resolved. But you can see here an attempt to make sense of even things like a crack in the wall was noted in that early depiction of the room that they had available to them before they would proceed to try to understand how this was affecting one's perceptual distortion. Researchers began to question, you know, what kinds of features were necessary and which ones would affect the outcome. Again, they're interested in doses, but they're really interested in the setting and the set being in the mindset. And I'll, I'll come to that in a moment too. They produced a number of guides, one of which is there on the left. This one you can find on the internet, um, but there are a few other ones. It's a long title, but I'll just read it out. The Handbook for the Therapeutic Use of Lysergic Acid Diethylamide 25, Individual and Group Procedures. And, and as I said, you, you can find this one online, um, but I'm, I'm hoping to publish some examples of some of the notes that they had leading up to this. They started thinking about things like music or how close are you to a bathroom? Do you have to walk through a hallway to use the bathroom? Does it have fluorescent lights? Questions like that that we might take for granted, but that they found really affected one's experience or sense of agency or ability to move freely in that space while under the influence, in this case, of LSD or masculine. And if you're interested in more, I, there's a couple of articles here I point to about specific music therapists and a number of women who also contribute to this. I won't go on to that right now, but I'll, I'll leave it for our conversation. One of the pieces that I think is really critical though, is looking outside of the clinical environment to try to understand how to affect that environment, but also to appreciate that even though these folks thought of themselves in some ways as psychedelic pioneers, they recognized that they were merely part of a longer legacy of adding their vocabulary and their scientific um, protocols to pre-existing ways of thinking about altered states of consciousness. In the case of the Saskatchewan researchers, they read anthropological literature, they scoured texts about other states of uh, non-ordinary states of consciousness um, and looked locally to indigenous communities who were in this case using peyote. The Native American church, uh, which was formally recognized in Saskatchewan in the 1950s, uh, used peyote as part of its ceremonial practices. The scientific researchers attended peyote ceremonies at the request of the Native American church and recognized that there were features of this design that they had not been taking fully into account. They had not appreciated how important drumming was, for example, 
to setting a rhythm for the experience. They had not considered singing as part of the experience and recognized that these features too were critical to how people experienced individually, but also how that affected the group experience in this case, as people sat in a circle in a ceremonial context. And I just want to quickly point out and acknowledge that like, it's harder to do when I'm not in person, but you can see in the top left image, there's a woman sitting there. Uh, there are a number of women in this ceremony, but this one I have inc included specifically because if you now go to the bottom right hand side of the screen, um, the tall man standing beside me, I'm very tall. I'm not very tall. Eduardo can uh, attest to that. Kelly's very tall though. Kelly is the grandson of the woman in the black and white photo. And he is the current president of the Native American church in Saskatchewan. Um, and I didn't know this until very recently. Every year they have an honor ceremony to thank the, um, scientists, the researchers who attended this ceremony as they started to communicate about the interaction between the Native American church and what was going on in the psychiatric clinic. Um, and until meeting Kelly and participating in a ceremony, I didn't understand the depth of that relationship. You can see in the center, um, William Russell has a, uh, it's a bit of a whistle flute, uh, it's a bone flute. Um, and beside him to his, sorry, to the right of the screen, I guess on his left, is Humphrey Osmond. Um, so this was that, that ceremony from 1956 where they came together and continued to uh, correspond and learn from one another. So I wanted to acknowledge this as sometimes an under-acknowledged piece of this history, where one example, at least, of Indigenous practices directly informing some of the context or trying to understand that setting piece or that environmental context. Although I think, so um, I, sh I guess I should back up just one moment. I think in the 1950s, there was a lot of optimism for where this psychedelic research might go and perhaps even where we might continue to learn from some of these ceremonial practices, although I don't think uh, it was as reciprocal as it could have been, um, but I am, I'm quite excited to explore this more. I think there's a real opportunity to draw attention to this past to demonstrate why we need to continue to explore this element more. But I think whatever momentum had accrued at that by then um, was overwhelmed by what we consider as sort of like the fall of psychedelics. And I think there has been a temptation by historians and journalists and filmmakers to blame hippies, I don't know, blame the Grateful Dead, um, blame uh, countercultural drug consumers. But I think there are scientific reasons why psychedelics fell out of favor as well. And, and I'll also blame those guys. Um, but uh I think concerns about the role of chemicals in our environment grew quite a lot uh, throughout the 1950s to a point where there were real risks involved. Risks like we saw with thalidomide, which was produced uh, in West Germany, but was distributed in lots of different places and caused major uh, birth defects, these teratogenic birth defects or um, deformities in children. There are also concerns about the impact of the Green Revolution, of course, fertilizing our soils and ruining sometimes um, soils for their capacity to produce uh, high yield crops and contributing to all of, a lot of challenges with respect to lead in our paint um, or chemicals in our bodies and in our environments. So I think a number of scientists and journalists were already questioning the place of chemicals in our environment. Scandals like thalidomide, I think, also concern pharmacological researchers. How should we actually measure the effects or the risks of pharmaceutical products 
before they go to market? How do we control for how people are going to use them? And we could probably have a whole conversation about who gets into these clinical trials and whether or not, you know, giving pharmaceuticals to pregnant women is ethical in the first place. Um, but there, there are all sorts of questions about how do we best mitigate these risks? Up until this point, the randomized controlled trial had been used, but was not the gold standard. That doesn't really happen until the mid 1960s. It's not until that time that most of the pharmaceutical research has to go through some form of randomization, of controls, of blinding. And if you think about the history of psychedelics, many of the researchers believed that it was ethical. And in fact, the most moral and valid instrument was yourself. You had to take psychedelics to know psychedelics. In the era of randomized controlled trials, researchers were meant to be objective and distanced from the subject, not taking the drug, certainly not even knowing which patients or subjects had taken the active dose. And as a result, we have a lot of methodological tension about how to measure the meanings and the risks associated with psychedelics. If you wanna learn about the American battles in the FDA, I highly recommend Matthew Oram's book on this topic where he'll walk you through the FDA concerns about how to measure and how to come up with some consensus on the best methods for measuring psychedelics, which they're, the answer is, sorry to ruin the end, there is no consensus. Researchers felt that applying randomized controlled trials to psychedelic research didn't fit their objectives, um, not just their ideological objectives, but they didn't feel that they could effectively uh, measure the way that psychedelics were working. They also felt that some of the wrong volunteers were signing up for trials, that university funded trials were getting a reputation for functioning as safe rooms or safe places to get proper supplies rather than the kinds of supplies that were beginning to circulate in the underground. Researchers had trouble getting funding for their work at this time and a number of psychedelic researchers moved on to other projects or moved away from psychedelics. By the early 1960s, I'll say 1963, January 1963, there was this fellow who also came online in a big way. Um, some of some historians talk about this as the Tim Leary effect. They might talk about the Michael Pollan effect. I don't know if they're the same, we can get into that, but Timothy Leary was a Harvard trained psychologist who started work kind of late in the psychedelic world at this time. He began work with psilocybin and prisoners in the late 1950s. And I recently looked through some of his papers. He's quite by the book for the first few years, but he becomes enchanted with the place of psych psilocybin and later psychedelics more broadly. And he leaves his job. He, he's uh, fired from his job at Harvard, probably for not showing up to classes, actually definitely for not showing up for classes, but he was also quite liberal in his recommendations that everyone take psychedelics. This generated quite a reputation and Leary did not shy away from the opportunity to move from his Harvard credentials to the kind of media darling of a psychedelic revolution. And he, he, um, becomes you know regularly featured in newspapers and magazines proselytizing or evangelizing a kind of psychedelic ethos that has very little to do with the clinical applications of psychedelics for the next few years in the 1960s there's a kind of explosion of um, psychedelics, we might say that they are kind of mainstreaming in some ways, but they also move outside of those laboratory contexts. They move onto the streets, if you will, into campuses, and become connected with a whole variety of projects um, that are seen as antithetical to the state in some cases. So if we think of the American context, um, 
protesting the Vietnam War is one of the key features that gets played up. I've recently learned, you may be familiar with this image at the top left. It is a Pulitzer Prize winning image. It's been in a lot of American news media of these protesters putting Gerber daisies into the barrel of these soldiers' guns. This is an act of protest against the Vietnam War or about the draft actually of college um, age men into the Vietnam War. I have it on good authority that the fellow in the turtleneck there, that's sort of the main center of the image, was one of, he was, a, he was probably a, a fairly, I don't know how to put this, he sold a lot of acid. Um, he went on to become an underground uh, LSD distributor. And um, so there is a direct connection here, although I don't believe the photographer or the committee members of the Pulitzer Prize um, knew that about him. It's only recently been revealed in, after his death that he too was part of the underground acid distribution. So in this way, I think psychedelics get kind of embedded in the cultural zeitgeist of the moment. These examples are mostly from the United States, but as I'll try to convince you, uh, actually, you need no convincing, I'm sure. Those kinds of projects explode in a variety of different ways around the world at this time. And certainly, um, if you're interested, Julio Del Monto, perhaps um, one of you can help me um, point to his book. I, I should have put it on the screen here, but uh, he has a whole history of this in Brazil. By the end of the 1960s, the Americans in some ways take the lead on beginning the war on drugs or ending the psychedelic era, at least in the published and legal space. Uh, a number of states criminalize LSD in the late 1960s and the United Nations convenes an international convention in 1971 where they place LSD and a list of other psychedelics on schedule one, which is deemed to have no medical value and be highly addictive or have a high potential for abuse, I should say. Uh, Richard Nixon, the US president at the time, singles out Timothy Leary as being the most dangerous man in America, although we don't know for sure that he said that, but it's assumed. Um, and a number of public health campaigns reframe psychedelics away from the groovy, you know, the woman seductively eating a mushroom to something that's going to cause you to lose your sanity uh, like this image here suggests. Now, for some historians, including myself in that earlier work, that's where the story ends. Psychedelics be fall out of favor with the scientific community. It's very difficult to get grants or to continue doing research or even illegal in many cases. And it kind of goes dark until the last 10 or 12 years. Maybe it's more than that now, Let's say since about 2007 or eight. But in some respects, the story doesn't end there. The story goes offline or stays offline in the sense that now there are a whole variety of psychedelic communities that continue to exist and even flourish, but do so in an underground space in a way that is not above ground, legal, or again, subject to the kind of um, legal or public scrutiny. We have things like water acid or the distribution of LSD on pieces of paper that now circulate in a variety of new ways. We have new chemists who work under pseudonyms. And of course, there is a explosion of cultural interest and cultural projects, including musical concerts where a number of psychedelics are circulating. Desktop publishing helps to facilitate the information uh, exchange or the communication about psychedelics in a way that can be anonymized and hard to trace, although there are a lot of PO box numbers on those. If you read the magazines, you can find out where to get mushroom spores. Um, but you find a lot of really clever, here are some examples again, these clever um, guides for how to identify, grow your own, um, make your own. There's a DMT manual as well. And you'll see these cool names like Mary Jane Superweed, uh, for homegrown highs. Um, and there are a variety of ways that people are continuing the psychedelic history, if you will, but doing so in anonymized ways or in ways that are harder to detect. And there's also this continued homage to indigenous presence 
Now, some of it I think is a bit superficial, um, but you've got the basement shaman and this image of this, it's meant to be uh, a Mazatec actually uh, statue that's kind of been overgrown. Um, this, if you, if you read really closely, Kat Harrison is the illustrator for this particular image and it comes from this psilocybin magic mushroom growers guide. Um, and Kat has allowed me to share this with you, um, but she's also was, she was very much drawn to the way that indigenous knowledge had been sort of overwhelmed by some of these other ways of telling the story. And she wanted to include that in this mushroom growers guide. So you'll see her very clever illustrated concepts of a kind of a shout out, if you will. Erica. Yeah. I just have to let you know that we have a few more minutes. Okay. I will, I will quickly go to the end. Thank you for letting me know. <laughs> Sorry for that. I could oh, no, 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 I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I wasn't keeping track of time. I'm watching Fernando to make sure I'm not going too fast and I wasn't watching time. I apologize. I'll just skip quickly to the end then. Um, some people don't stay in the underground like these folks. Some people do like the makers of this blotter acid. Um, and here's uh, Julio's book. I just, I just want to suggest that what we do know about the underground comes from working with those communities. And yet there are a variety of undergrounds, just like there's a diversity of psychedelic histories. There are a variety of ways that this story also goes into other corners of our communities around the world. And these are stories that I think in some ways are, are less told. I think Julio's book goes some, uh, what I've read of it in uh, translation um, helps to tell that story in Brazil. Um, but there are other examples. We are now in a psychedelic so-called renaissance or resurgence, um, and we see a reframing of this history. Uh, and I'm going to be here as a historian saying, I think we need to keep widening the lens on history um, rather than, than keeping it narrow. And there are lots of voices in this space claiming that kind of upper hand, trying to understand how best to get a handle this time on how we should use psychedelics sustainably going forward. Um, some of that's moving into institutional spaces. Universities are reinvesting in psychedelic research. And so far to my knowledge, most of that cleaves to that scientific story, that clinical story. Um, but by way of conclusion, I wanna suggest that if we keep the, the canvas big or the, the scope large, I think we can see that psychedelics are not only poised to help us to think differently about therapy, but also to think differently about some of those cultural priorities. Um, and I just offer up a couple of suggestions here about thinking about the relationship with the underground, thinking about reconciling or understanding, deepening that relationship with indigenous practices and trying to understand also the kind of financial legacy that we can appreciate from psychedelics that a lot of philanthropists and um, I guess privileged voices have sometimes overwhelmed the conversation uh, that doesn't necessarily leave room for the diverse ways that people know or experience psychedelics. So this is my final conclusion. Um, just to say that uh, thank you very much. I, I'm very excited to be here and I really do think that Thinking about diversity and inspiring that kind of diversity is the best path for a sustainable future, whatever that might look like. And I look forward to your questions and I apologize for going on too long. Oh, you don't need to apologize. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I'll uh, stop sharing there. Well, I'm going directly to the questions. Uh, the first one here is Vanessa asking if you know why entheogens are not use, used as much as psychedelics, the word. Yeah, I don't have a, a good answer for you. Entheogens was a, a word introduced in 1979 by anthropologists and ethnobotanists, and it meant to also reinvigorate ideas about the god within or plant teachers. And I haven't seen that word sort of persisting in this context to the same degree, which cynically might mean because today's uh, story is often not told by 
um, ethnobotanists, but more by those within the clinical context. Um, that might be part of the reason. And uh, unfortunately, it's not a very satisfying answer. I don't have actual evidence for that. That's just my hunch. <laughs> wow. Okay, the second question here is from Mariana Maka. Uh, she said she's admired by your, your path. And uh, she's asking, uh, she's curious about how you started to study uh, this, the, the history of psychedelics. It's so boring. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I was like nerdily, I was, I was a total nerd for why these people were coming to Saskatchewan to try to create publicly funded healthcare. I was like, why are they taking all these drugs to give us medicine? You know, <laughs> but I was fascinated by why, like the marrying of a political project with a, a scientific project or what kind of science did they feel was required to create a kind of equitable access to healthcare? Um, and I was really sort of drawn to that political side of things. And then I kind of fell in love with the way that curious people came together to make sense of the mind. Okay, um, Erika, uh, Larissa Carneiro, is ask, she said that she's interested in the relationship between recruiting volunteers from for psychedelic trials. One mm -hmm. of the suggested articles demonstrated a higher number of white people in these trials. In her family, uh, I am familiar with the recruiting by John Hopkins University, and it's very hard to recruit people who check all the boxes that needed to be checked. Is it still mm -hmm. hard? to for the scientific community to get a, a population for trials that can be encompassing that's beyond my scope of practice i'm allowed i'm not allowed to run a clinical trial um though i am visiting one tomorrow so i'll ask them and let you know uh but my impression from speaking with people about this is that yes it is it continues to be very difficult um to find people in fact i know uh, recently in canada the many, many people are rejected for the trials and they're, they're really quite specific criteria. And some trials have been completely taken offline in a sense because they weren't able to meet the criteria. Uh, I think that Health Canada, the American FDA, these regulatory bodies are very nervous about psychedelics, um, partly because of this historical reputation. And I think they're making really strict criteria, which unfortunately... I think actually kind of misses the point for bringing that diversity to bear. Psychedelics are not alone in these kind of clinical trial diversity issues. Um, but I think psychedelics have a, an extra burden to bear with the reputation of them in the past. Um, I'm in a few days speaking about psychedelic equity to the BC government, the British Columbia government in Canada. And this is exactly the question that they want forefronted. So we're working with an indigenous community in or two indigenous communities in British Columbia to try to talk about why a number of indigenous people in Canada, and I predict around the world, are also quite reluctant to sign up for trials. Uh, there's quite a historical reputation for not treating people fairly in these trial contexts. Um, so I think there's a much deeper set of questions involved in checking boxes to meet those diversity criteria, but also to really think carefully and deeply about why people have not signed up for science. Um, the next question is from Maristela and she's asking you to talk a little bit about Maria Sabina contribution. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I should have mentioned if I, oh, I, I don't think I can go back to the slideshow. Apologies. Um, I have an image and homage to her from a, a young Indigenous artist in Oaxaca who uh, is using pigment and clay and soil from the area where Maria Sabina lived and and uh, in that community. And he's turning it into um, the, the content for the paintings that he's doing. Uh, these really beautiful a really beautiful sort of um, way of honoring her legacy, but really tying it to the land as well, which is, I think, a really beautiful and an important component here. I, 
you know, Maria Sabina is such a fascinating character. In some ways, she comes up as this sort of sacrificial emblem of uh, an indigenous woman bringing uh, this American banker to the site of psilocybin. And I think that story has kind of been condensed into this, you know, horrible story of appropriation. And there are elements of that that absolutely we need to be mindful of. But what's interesting to me is it's not the whole story um, that American banker Gordon Wasson was married to a Russian ethnomycologist whose massive two volume compendium on folkloric traditions in Eastern Russia is still the foremost source about women's knowledge of mushrooms in that entire part of the world. And his wife, it was actually, uh, sorry, Valentina Pavlova Wasson, I want to say her name, is probably the one responsible for thinking about Maria Sabina in the first place. And unfortunately, Valentina died uh, just a year later in 1958 after this historic meeting took place and her name kind of drops off. But importantly, I think um, that meeting was not just an accident of some rich banker going to Oaxaca and, you know, taking mushrooms. That's how the story has been ca characterized. But Gordon Wasson, and I know this sounds apologetic, but some of the records that we have about, uh, and I'll mispronounce this, uh, Oaxaca Jimenez, the, the community where Maria, uh, Maria Sabina lived, uh, he recorded the songs. He translated uh, the ceremonial practices and these this rare collection of songs is still available um, because he went and tried to work with the community. He was disappointed, maybe like we all should be, that, you know, Bob Dylan decided to go and, you know, make this into a cool place. And then people threw their trash around and, you know, burned down her house. And there was a very difficult um, set of consequences to revealing the little teachers or the mushrooms that um, she introduced Gordon Wasson to. Um, but I'm not sure that it was Wasson's fault as much as what happens to those stories once they get out. And I think that's something that we need, need to be mindful of in this psychedelic space as well. I don't know if that was a satisfying answer. <laughs> Erika, we have Daniel now. He mm. wants to ask you a question. Hi, Daniel. Hi, Erika. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a question. I know you're a historian. You're 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 not a futurist, but uh, <laughs> we're starting off the year, and I would like to have this in mind to keep this in mind as we we, we go along the year talking. What's your opinion about the, 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 the challenges that uh, we are going to face in the field? And if you think the challenges are going to hit us uh, all the same, like researchers, mm -hmm. clinicians, indigenous populations, uh, underground users, recreational users, what's your take on the on what's coming? And also the the whole digital revolution where we're living in the the spread of information, true or false information, and what stories are going to to be to start being told? Thank you. Those are great questions. Uh, ooh. Trying to be brief and not uh, flippant about this, but I do worry that uh, if we rush, we will take the magic out of the mushrooms, or choose your, uh, <laughs> or we'll take the DMT out of the ayahuasca if you want, or the, you know, um, but. I worry that uh, pharmaceuticalizing uh, psychedelics will actually lose a very important historic opportunity to think about what psychedelics represent, not just in that clinical space, uh, but in this much bigger cultural space, uh, political space, even if you will. So I'm worried about rushing or the kind of gold rush that we see in psychedelics, you know, in an attempt to try to figure out if we get this many people through trials, then we can prove that it's safe and we can use it in this way that might be good, but I think that's going to be very uh, restricted in terms of its applications. And to reach, uh, sort of connect with your second question, people are going to take psychedelics whether or not they are legal. There is some proof <laughs> that that's already been happening. I mean, there's quite a lot of proof <laughs> that that's already been happening. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned that maintaining the prohibition means that people take greater risks to gain access to psychedelics in harmful ways or ways that 
I mean, just not having stable supplies or taking lying about where they get them from or what happens when you go to the hospital. Prohibition, I think, is bad for the truth <laughs> um, and transparency. But I think um, rushing to regulate them and and scale that up also has real challenges ahead. And I don't think it's sustainable if we rush to that end line. Um, I and this is my soapbox, but I would like to see, you know, taking a step back and thinking about what's actually at stake, because it's very important that sufferers gain access to alternative ways of dealing with these persistent mental health conditions. But that is not the only project that's sort of on the table here. Um, and like I say, I, I really, I strongly believe that there's an opportunity to think in more, in genuinely more um, diverse ways. Uh, Indigenous knowledge is the, the one example that just like leaps to mind. Um, I, I sit on a number of boards right now in Canada. I've spoken in Parliament. I've spoken to our Health Canada, our, our kind of FDA. And I'm like, where, why are there not Indigenous people invited to these tables? Um, now, sometimes there are Indigenous people invited to the tables who don't want to sit there for good reasons. But that's a bigger complex issue that I think actually needs to be sorted out. Um, before we can roll ahead with saying, okay, something is safe or something is not safe, because there are a whole host of issues that I think are actually more important than the regulatory fate of psychedelics before we can imagine where how they'll play out in communities. People are going to get access to information, especially on the internet now. Uh, like I said, I didn't know who Timothy Leary was because I was too lazy to go to a card catalog. Um, but I mean, I definitely would have looked him up on my phone if that were the case today, just like if I feel like finding I'm in Madison right now, if I want to find mushrooms, I can probably find them by looking on my phone. Um, and I don't believe they're legal here. So, you know, things are going to change people's access to this, you know, the kind of information they want, they can find, we can find. Um, is that good information? Uh, I'm not convinced. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Isabella. Hi, good night. Thank Hi. you, Erica. First of all, thank you for being here with us, like giving a good start for this, this study that you're going to have this year. So my question like transformed to the time because you're giving small answers about it, but I would like to personally ask you to say a little bit more about this indigenous knowledges and how can we build bridges mm. from the past to the present to the future? like you said in your presentation, because, you know, how can we talk about it? Because I think mainly for in Brazil, ayahuasca country, everything, we, we are like saying, talking and seeing these indigenous people right now, like we have one with here with, with us tonight. So we are kind of kind of only in these places of good talking with the indigenous people. So I'd like to hear from you. What do you think about what are you, we are facing now? What do you think about the future? How can we like start this conversation in a good way, you know, about this indigenous knowledges and psychedelic assisted therapy in the future and everything? Well, I think we should ask Yuri and Makari. Is that? Also, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Also. I mean, that that would be this. Uh, this is what I'm learning from from the communities I've worked with and the individuals who graciously, you know, invited me to work with them um, is the, like listening first. Um, and second of all, learning to put psychedelics aside, um, that often that's not the starting place in the conversation. Uh, it may become part of the conversation, but that, you know, rush in my example for, you know, I, I participated in a peyote ceremony and, the amazing women who took me under their wing, they're like, just, just relax. Just like, first we make food, then we don't eat it. I mean, we will have it for later. Um, we have to, you know, we have to breathe. We have to prepare. We have to think we, we do all of these things. And this is just for one ceremony. She said, you know, to appreciate what uh, the medicine has to offer, you know, first we got to like take stock of our kinship. 
you know, who, who are we here for? Why are we here? All of these kinds of, we talk about it as intention setting sometimes in that clinical space, but really genuinely thinking about that and what I've learned. And I, again, give props to Eduardo for connecting me through WhatsApp and through Google Translate uh, with some amazing people who have been artists who are um, representing uh, some of this work in Brazil is, you know, thinking about not just, again, not just psychedelics, but thinking about the place of the future in the planet and the re relationship to plants in a meaningful way, not in an extractionist way or in that kind of, you know, you know, how do we extract meaning or um, how do we industrialize this or how do we use this plant to further a, another project, but just like pausing thinking, maybe asking questions about that relationship in the first place. And it's like, maybe we'll get to psychedelics, but that could take a while. Um, even when we're talking about, you know, the peyote cactus, we may not talk about the psychedelic meaning that we want to quickly try to understand or extract from it. Um, and that degree of patience is something that I've, I really, uh, I really respect. And, and I think it's hard to sort of use that as a quick answer. Like we need to like slow down and listen. Um, but unfortunately that's my answer. <laughs> okay, we reached the end. Um, Erika, I'm gonna speak in Portuguese now because we have a little few announcements and then Eduardo is gonna say a few words. Uh, um, Bo, Marina, você quer falar? Oi, Bela, você quer Just remember to switch your audio channel if you're switching languages. And also, if Fernando can change yeah. and translate to Erika the last words we're going to say in Portuguese, that would be super fun. <laughs> Bom, então eu já passo para Marina direto, Marina, para você falar sobre o curso. São dois, dois anúncios rapidinhos e aí o Eduardo vai fazer uma falha e a gente encerra. É, desculpa, gente, eu tô meio perdida que eu fiquei aqui no suporte tentando ajudar as pessoas que estavam tentando entrar e não conseguiram. É, eu vou, a, é, a partir de amanhã, em 24 horas, a gente deve ter esse encontro tanto no áudio original em inglês quanto a tradução simultânea em português, em 24 horas lá na IAD Plataforma. É, se alguém tiver qualquer dificuldade, por favor, me procura ou equipe de suporte no suporte arroba institutofoneros.org.br uh, ou no WhatsApp do Instituto, que é 11 933 404 953. É, são todos muito bem-vindos. É um prazer imenso a gente é, ter começado as atividades desse ano com a presença da Érica. É, eu sei que tem mais, mais livros e coisas saindo dela por aí esse ano, é, sei que tem um livro que fala, inclusive, sobre a, essa questão da história das mulheres é, no, nesse, grande, é, nesse grande arco né, dos psicodélicos do mundo. Então, é, já me perguntaram, Érica, se por acaso tem livro seu traduzido para o português. A gente tem contato com uma uma editora muito bacana aqui no Brasil, que traduz os livros do Groff, de repente a gente pode tentar conversar sobre essa possibilidade em algum outro momento, fazer essa ponte, mas é isso, eu queria agradecer muito a presença de todos e seguimos aqui, o que vocês precisarem podem contar comigo, tá bom? Boa noite. Bom, Vitor, eu vou passar depois a sua pergunta para a Érica, tá? Eu vi agora só que ainda tem mais uma, mas a gente está realmente estourado no tempo. É, eu queria dar um minutinho de palavra para a Júlia para falar sobre o nosso tema da nossa próxima aula, semana que vem. Boa noite, gente. Eu vou ser bem breve e agradecer a Érica em português mesmo. Obrigada, Érica. Maravilhosa, inspiradora a aula e também desafio para a gente que vai estar na semana que vem dando continuidade ao tema no Recorte Brasileiro, né? Edu vai estar como convidado especial para a gente conversar sobre o panorama das pesquisas com psicodélicos no Brasil. Então, é, você já desse uma grande contribuição mesmo nessa contextualização mundial para a gente fazer o recorte aqui no nosso território. E depois também vai vir discussão com Isabela, né? também pensando essas, essas problemáticas, essas questões que a gente tem que fazer. Eu acho que fechar 
o encontro de hoje, sabendo que é mais importante né, para a ciência também fazer mais perguntas do que só buscar respostas e, enfim, acelerar processos, eu acho que é uma boa deixa. E é isso, gente. Até terça-feira que vem, por favor, estejam por aqui com a gente, que vai ser massa. <risos> é isso. Edu? Uau! Uau, uau, uau! <risos> Erika, thank you so much. Uh, that was an amazing, uh, mind-expanding, mind-blowing, heart-opening uh, talk uh, and presentation. Uh, yes, Fernando, if you can uh, please switch back translating uh, to Portuguese. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, Uh, emocionado, how, how should I say that in English? Uh, I'm moved, yeah, thank you. Overwhelmed. And kind of overwhelmed, yeah. It's it's for us a, a, a very important uh, moment tonight to get back uh, of this community and to have you here and the way you framed uh, such a, a long uh, history, multifaceted, Uh, and and the way you honored uh, the indigenous knowledge and the way how you problematized the scientific approach and the importance and controversies of having personal experiences uh, with psychedelics to understand psychedelics and the objectivity concept and approach in science, uh, issues of double blinding, uh, which I'm also writing about. So we have lots uh, to keep sharing and, and exchanging. Uh, I also super really want you to connect you uh, with uh, Inti Garcia Flores, uh, Massatec historian, uh, who has uh, and is taking charge uh, of Maria Sabina's uh, tapes and writings uh, in Walter de Jimenez in Oaxaca, where uh, me and Marina, uh, we've been there 10 years, 12 years ago, quite a long time. Uh, but Inti is a dear friend, um, and you, I think this, uh, uh, this lecture tonight captures all the topics that we have organized for Fanero's community. So for everybody who's watching, uh, everybody who's here in the webinar, people who are on YouTube watching, uh, all these issues and problems and challenges and promises and difficulties uh, will be covered uh, in our sessions uh, during the year from the many perspectives. So psychedelics are much, much more than the new antidepressant pill. And perhaps they should never be conceptualized as an antidepressant pill. And, and I love the way how you closed uh, and how you discussed uh, about the perils of taking the magic out of the mushrooms. So I, I fully agree. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm super, super uh, thankful in the name of everyone here. Uh, there are tons of applause and, and gratitude for you on the chat. And suppose you didn't have really time to, to be looking there. It's difficult to do at the same time. And wishing you a great uh, talk tomorrow in Madison as well. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's o fim da nossa noite, grande noite, thank you very much, Erika, uh, no more words, sem mais palavras, gente, uhum. agradecer a todos por todo esse apoio, por todo o apoio. Enjoy our dinner. Tchau. Bye bye everyone, see you next week. Tchau, gente. Boa noite, pessoal. Tchau.